Welcome again, everyone, and thank you for joining the Ohio Environmental Council's 2022 Annual Meeting of Members. My name is Pete Booker. I'm the Chief of Staff for the OEC. We appreciate everyone joining this afternoon to hear a little bit about what the OEC has been up to this year. Throughout the event, including right now, we will share a link in the chat for our slate of board members uh, to be voted on. This link is for members of the OEC to vote on our officer slate for board members whose terms are expiring this year. We ask that only members uh, vote using this link. A member is including anyone who's donated at least $5 to the OEC in the fiscal year 2022. So if you can say that you've done that, you can go ahead and vote. Additionally, this will be a panel style event. Our moderator, Anna Siriano, will ask questions to our staff about the work this year, but we encourage you to drop questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A panel in Zoom located at the bottom of your screen in the middle. We will do our best to address all the questions that we get at the end of the meeting. If you have any technical questions, please send them to us directly by emailing oec at theoec.org. Well, with all those logistics out of the way, let's get over to the fun. Uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you, Pete. And thank you all for joining us. Whether you are a member or not, it's clear that if you're here, you care a lot about Ohio's environment and a lot about Ohio. I'm the OEC's Director of Membership Engagement. I love my role because number one, I get to be a cheerleader for all the awesome staff that we have and all the great work that they do. And number two, I get to continually meet uh, amazing Ohioans who impress me all the time with their conscientiousness and their commitment to protecting Ohio uh, and to making progress on climate change. With that, I want to get into this panel sesh because not to toot my own horn, but I have some pretty good questions lined up here that I think will give you a little bit more insight into some of the work we've been doing and um, how our amazing, amazing staff is making a real difference here in Ohio. So first up, we're going to talk about democracy. Democracy, you might be a little confused. Why is an environmental organization talking about democracy? But if you've been keeping up with us, then you know that we like to say it takes a healthy and democracy to create a healthy environment. And this past year, we really saw how unhealthy the democracy in Ohio has become. In the chat is a link to our annual report, which dives more deeply into the timeline on this. But uh, long story short, some Republican lawmakers came in hard to gerrymander our state house maps and our congressional maps, and the OEC and our partners came in harder to try to stop it. The Ohio Supreme Court agreed with us five times in a suit contending the state house maps were unfair, but because of stalling tactics and uh, the maps went through. Boo! It was a win for us that our cases proved the maps were unfairly drawn, but it was a loss for Ohioans that the process to rectify them failed. Uh, the process to rectify it failed them. So um, I'm gonna lob my first question to Spencer Dierig, our political director. Um, unfortunately, Chris Tavener, our director of democracy policy, who does a lot of this work, um, is testifying right now, trying to fight to save our democracy. Um, so I think he has a pretty excuse for, for being out, but Spencer is wonderful. And so um, he's filling in. So my first question for you, Spencer, why even vote? Told you I had some good questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with everyone. Uh, I am a poor substitute for Chris Tavener, who has done a phenomenal job over the last uh, year and more, of course, uh, fighting every single day to make sure that Ohio's democracy is free and it is fair and accessible to every Ohioan. Um, I, he's actually down in the state house right now trying to testify against two terrible pieces of legislation that we'll be talking about, I'm sure, a little bit later here. Um, but if one thing is clear, it's that voting is important. And we know that because the people who oppose our environmental progress, the people who want to take us backward on climate change and want to fail to take action on the biggest existential crisis of our generation, are actively trying to make sure it's harder to vote, that we have less access to the ballot box, and that it's increasingly harder to make a difference in our communities by utilizing our democracy. And so it's incredibly important to vote because every single time you vote, you are putting out there 
the values and the, um, you know, the issues that you want to see handled by our government. Um, we are extremely excited about the progress that has been made, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. As Anna mentioned, uh, you know, the folks at the state house uh, and those in power have worked hard to maintain a unfair partisan gerrymander of the state of Ohio, distorting Ohio's um, political um, representation and making it harder for us to be fairly represented by our state government. But that does not mean that your vote does not matter. We have incredibly important elections on the statewide all the way down to the local level that every day impact the future of our environment and the future of our climate. So even if you feel like your district is gerrymandered or your state house representative doesn't listen to you, there are countless important issues on the ballot in every election, and it is incredibly important to vote. For instance, Ohioans next year will have a whole host of local elections across the state of Ohio. We uh, were really involved in local elections over in 2021, and we had some great successes, and we know how important that those uh, elections have been on the work that has been done since 2021 to move our environment forward and move action on the climate crisis forward. And we know 2023 will be a brand new opportunity to do those same things, to elect climate champions, of course, but also to make the environment an important part of the uh, statewide district course, and to do things like pass park levies that protect public uh, green spaces. And so voting is critically important and protecting voting rights continues to be a key goal of this organization. Thank you, Spencer. So you kind of mentioned already that we're seeing some legislation out of Ohio Secretary of State, LaRosa's office, uh, attempting to make it harder to pass ballot measures. Can you brief, briefly explain what a ballot measure is and how this could impact Ohioans, as well as other attempts we might see at suppressing our democratic rights at the state level? Yeah, absolutely. So a referendum, um, you know, one of the few ways that we have in the state of Ohio to take you know, what the general population wants and to actually deliver it into state policy um, is through the referendum process, through the ballot initiative process. What is great about the ballot initiative process is it allows everyday citizens to put forth an idea, to put that idea in front of the voters and to get an understanding of whether the voters support it or not, and then to create policy based on that understanding. Um, you know, this is a great uh, runaround to the to the fact that, you know, our state house is gerrymandered or that our state government does not seem to be interested often in, in, in addressing some of these key issues. And so ballot initiatives really do provide a great opportunity for the citizens of Ohio to have their voice heard in their government. Of course, the those who want to take us backward also know that ballot initiatives are a great opportunity for Ohioans to take these issues into their own hands. And that's why, unfortunately, Secretary of State uh, Frank LaRose and others have decided to try and make it harder for Ohioans to change the constitution via ballot uh, initiative. And so there, um, the House Joint Resolution 6, it's being heard for the first time today. Uh, they are trying to change it so that more, than, currently only a majority of Ohio's voters need to approve a constitutional amendment in order for that uh, amendment to pass. And to be clear, it is incredibly hard to pass a constitutional amendment in the state of Ohio by ballot initiative It requires hundreds of thousands of signatures. It requires millions on millions of dollars um, in campaigning. Um, but right now, at the end of the day, if a majority of Ohioans agree that the Constitution should be changed, then the Constitution is changed. However, those who want to continue to hold us back are uh, have decided to put forth a joint resolution um, that would change this to make it so that 60% of uh, Ohioans would have to vote in favor of the constitutional amendment in order for that amendment to pass. This is a really deliberate attempt to decrease the power of Ohio voters. It's something that has been tried and has failed in numerous other states because the voters saw through the uh, degradation of democracy that was being put forth. So it's incredibly important that we continue advocating on this. Uh, Chris Tavner is down in, at the State House right now uh, talking about it. 
If this joint resolution does pass, though, it'll be on the ballot in May. And so it'll be incredibly important that we have a strong environmental majority out at the ballot box uh, to make sure that we protect democracy in Ohio. Unfortunately, though, that's not the only place that democracy is currently being attacked. We also see House Bill 294, which is in the Go Government Oversight Committee today, another one of the uh, Bill that Chris Tavener is working hard on down at the State House today uh, on behalf of the OEC Action Fund, our sibling organization. Um, this Health Bill 294 would add a whole bunch of confusing provisions to our election processes that would make it even more difficult for people to cast their ballot. Uh, it would do things like change early voting hours, change requirements for absentees. It would really fundamentally make voting harder in Ohio. And so even if this bill doesn't pass this year, we're likely to see it show up next year too. Um, instead of bills that make it harder to vote, at the OEC, we support policies like automatic voter registration and same day voter registration like they have in Michigan that will make it easier for Ohioans to get out and have their voice heard. We support uh, robust absentee ballot request systems to make sure everyone can vote in the way that works best for them. These are common sense measures to be taken that just remove the barrier between Ohioans and having their voice heard. Because we know that when Ohioans have their voice heard, they speak up for the environment and they will protect our planet. And we want to make sure that we continue to make it easier for everyone to have their voice heard and to vote. Thank you, Spencer. And, uh, you know, thank you all for the work that you are doing. Um, yes, we want more people voting. Uh, for sure. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our next uh, issue area, which is energy. Um, so with us, we have Nolan Rutschling. Um, and I wanted to talk about uh, him to talk about two pieces of energy legislation we've been uh, looking at and working on this year. So first, we've been all aboard the Energy Jobs and Justice Act train. Choo-choo! which is a piece of state legislation currently co-sponsored by Reps Casey Weinstein and Juanita Brent. This legislation was a response to the massive Ohio energy bribery scandal that came out of House Bill 6. Basically, a coalition of environmental organizations and climate champions came together to say, enough trying to play in a game where the other team is cheating. We're gonna make a whole new game and write our own rules and it's going to take Ohio by storm like humans versus zombies or pickleball. So Nolan, you've been playing this game for a year now. What would you say are the rules of the new game for Ohio's energy future versus how it's historically been played? Thanks, Anna. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, as I imagine a lot of the folks attending today are aware energy policy in Ohio hasn't always been equitable. It's often been shaped by powerful interests, particularly fossil fuel companies and private utilities. These companies are often focused on subsidizing dirty, extractive energy generation sources such as coal and natural gas and opposing renewable energy development, energy efficiency, and uh, opposing action on climate change in general. Rather, as Anna said, rather than focusing on only playing defense against these companies and, and focusing only on stopping bad bills uh, or, or focusing solely on the numerous bribery scandals that are still playing out across the state, the OEC and a diverse group of partners, including Black environmental leaders, Ohio Citizen Action and Action for the Climate Emergency, are working on a bold, comprehensive movement that's focused on this piece of energy legislation called the Energy Jobs and Justice Act, or EJA, E-J-J-A, also known as House Bill 429, at least in this General Assembly. EJA has three core tenets. It, it's focused on equity. It creates an energy justice office focused on supporting all, all Ohioans and ensuring they can afford uh, to pay their, their utility bills and that they're represented equi equitably. It also has a number of elements focused on workforce development to ensure that no, no one's left behind in the energy transition. It's focused on carbon emission reduction. So it, it includes a carbon reduction plan for the state of Ohio and levels the playing field for renewable energy. And then the third uh, pillar of EJA is transparency and accountability. So I mentioned those bribery scandals and controversies earlier. 
What EJA does is it reforms the PUCO rate making process in a number of ways and creates accountability for utilities. So equity, carbon emission reduction, and transparency and accountability. This bill had a hearing earlier this year in which co-sponsors Representative Casey Weinstein and Representative Juanita Brent gave testimony. Look, the bill is bold, it's, uh, it's comprehensive. It's got a tough road to pass this General Assembly as, we're, as we move into lame duck, but the OEC uh, and our, our partners plan to support reintroduction of the bill in the next General Assembly and continue working to build grassroots supports for the legislation. As the Inflation Reduction Act showed, bold climate action is possible. Yes, I love it. If I had a Vuvuzela with me, uh, everyone would be annoyed with me right now. So you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which includes the most money ever committed to addressing climate change in US history. It was a piece of federal legislation that passed. In fact, just a couple of weeks before it passed, you were on Capitol Hill, along with our partners at Power Clean Future Ohio, at the invitation of Sen Senator Sherrod Brown, sharing about a major report we authored, the co-authored that uh, analyzed the potential cost to Ohio if we don't act on climate change. So uh, this question is for Spencer and Nolan. Um, you did a lot of work this year advocating uh, for a federal climate bill in addition to helping get this funding passed, how is the OEC in a great position to make sure the funds are used well? Yeah, thanks, Anna. And look, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about this bill, but it really is uh, revolutionary legislation. It's the boldest climate action we've ever taken at the national level, at least so far. And this legislation will revolutionize Ohio's economy and our environment. It'll do that by creating jobs through incentivizing domestic manufacturing. Uh, the White House estimates that it'll bring $12.8 billion of investment in large scale clean power generation and storage to Ohio between now and 2030. It also has incentives for workforce development in BIPOC communities and communities with legacy energy economy. So communities where maybe there used to be coal mining or coal plants or natural gas extraction, their particular carve outs for those folks so they're not left behind in the clean energy transition. Uh, the legislation will also lower our energy bill. Uh, it'll, there's a number of tax credits, number of incentives for energy efficiency, renewable energy, and other measures to, to make sure we can all afford our, to keep the lights on and, and the heat on. And finally, uh, the bill focuses really, really strongly on environmental justice, energy justice, and climate justice. There's a ton in this bill, but I'm particularly excited about this. There's a lot of funding and incentives for investment in BIPOC communities. I could spend the, the rest of this hour talking about all that's in that legislation, but here's the deal. Ohio won't see all of these benefits if we don't advocate. We don't advocate at the state and local level. Many of these programs require the state government to apply and distribute these funds. We at the Ohio Environmental Council are prepared to push the state, work with the state, and encourage our, our state government to take advantage of all these opportunities to ensure no one is left behind. We'll need your help. We also will work to empower local leaders to take advantage of opportunities in collaboration with our partners in the Power of Clean Future Ohio Coalition, or PCFO. PCFO now has 41 communities across the state focused on climate action and sustainability, with over a third of all Ohioans focused on, uh, or excuse me, with over a third of all Ohioans living in a power of clean future Ohio community. We're excited to work to make sure all Ohio communities can benefit from this legislation. And I'll turn it over to Spencer. Thank you. And thank you, Nolan, and our incredible energy team for all of the phenomenal work that they've done and continue to do to make sure that the Inflation Reduction Act really has the maximum impact for Ohioans here in our state. So, I mean, I just want to underline, take one second to underline how critical the Inflation Reduction Act is. This is the largest investment in climate action in our nation's history and perhaps even in world history. This is not a small feat and I am incredibly honored 
every single day to be able to say that I'm a small part of an organization that had a big hand in trying to make it happen. The OEC Action Fund engaged really heavily with state and local partners and national partners to help pass the largest investment in climate action in our nation's history. And that is something we can all be incredibly proud of. Not just the largest investment, but an investment that focuses on justice and anti-racist principles that will help mediate and uh, and deal with you know generations of environmental racism. These are real, real uh, impacts that this legislation will have. Um, but our work is not over. Our work is only really getting started um, now that we have passed this legislation. The Ohio Environmental Council has developed and positioned climate champions in places of power all across the state of Ohio, from the local level to the state level to the federal level. And we are engaging with these elected officials and depending on deep relationships that we've built with them to implement climate policy and also brainstorm new ideas to advance the cause of environmentalism. And no one does this better than our phenomenal regional uh, directors. These folks know the climate champions, they work with them on a daily basis and are in a prime position to help these climate champions use the federal funding to make the largest impact possible in the state of Ohio. And so I'll throw it over to Anna to talk more about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, we have an amazing regional team. So we are um, in a, we have a really cool setup at OEC where um, our policy team who are issue experts with knowledge of major funding and legislation decisions at the federal, state level, uh, local level are able to work with our regional field directors to connect this information to local organizations and governments, um, especially those climate champions that Spencer was talking about. Um, there are a ton of great tools at the local level that uh, municipalities can take advantage of um, to be huge contributors to climate action, even when things are tougher at the state and federal level. For example, our former Northwest Ohio Regional Director, Nick Mandros, worked with Toledo City Council to pass a budget amendment, widely known as the 1% for the environment, that requires at least 1% of the annual capital improvement budget goes to environmental protection, sustainability, and climate resilience, and created a full-time position in the mayor's office dedicated to climate action. So I would love for the regional directors to share about some of the tools that have been used in the cities and their regions this year to address environmental issues. So first up, Brian Siggers, who is our Cleveland Metro Director. Um, you So up in Cleveland, what have you had going on there? Yeah, so um, as Anna said, I'm Brian Siggers. I serve as the Cleveland Metro Advocacy Director for the Ohio Environmental Council. And a lot of the work that we do with our Cleveland program is guided by our Cleveland Comprehensive Policy Platform. Uh, the policy platform was developed prior to the municipal elections in 2021 and provided uh, an incoming administration with policy recommendations focused on energy, water, environmental justice, transportation, and parks and green spaces. A key component of what we're doing uh, in the city of Cleveland is cultivating relationships with community stakeholders, elected officials, and environment, environmentally focused organizations to see these things, uh, see the items from the policy platform play out. Um, we also convene an organization called the Cleveland Envi Environmental Advocacy Coalition, which was which developed the policy platform, and we remain actively in, engaging in monthly meetings to review and update our legislative tracker that monitors progress on the policy goals and make sure that we're moving through with that. And some of the wins that we'd like to share are like the passage of the Complete and Green Streaks Ordinance. Uh, the Complete and Green Streaks Ordinance, uh, we submitted a comment and we're excited to announce that uh, the ordinance will improve the condition of uh, road projects among city departments, require street designs to prioritize vulnerable road users, invest in green infrastructure measures, and create an oversight committee to review road projects, ensure that the designs are met uh, for all road users. Uh, also, the city of Cleveland has issued an RFP on its parks and uh, recreation master plan uh, in collaboration with our partners for the trust of public land. Uh, Cleveland was chosen for the 10 minute uh, walk park equity accelerator program. Uh, and this program has goals to advance our local parks and enhance the quality of life for all Cleveland residents. Uh, the city of Cleveland also hired its uh, director of sustainability and climate justice. And this past August, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with Director Sarah O'Keefe and share information about OEC, our family of organizations, and our Cleveland program. We were well received and uh, we remain in consistent co communication with uh, Director O'Keefe and her office. Uh, lastly, uh, the city of Cleveland announced uh, that the members of the Urban Forest Commission are 
and uh, approved and uh, we're excited that we have representation from partners from our coalition. Uh, the Urban Forestry Co uh, Commission is looking to explore new ways to provide a safe urban forest while striving to preserve its natural beauty and we're glad to see that it's operational. Uh, this past October, we supported the OEC Action Fund and we, as they hosted a Cleveland fundraiser headlined by Mayor Justin Bibb. And uh, we had an appearance from County, Cuyahoga County Executive Elect Chris Ronane. Uh, Mayor Bibb has been a strong ally and supporter of the work that we're doing in the city of Cleveland. We're looking forward to working with uh, Chris Ronane uh, as he assumes office next January. Also in October, we were able to attend the EPA's Clean Water Fest. Uh, where we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Clean Water Act. And we had an opportunity to speak briefly with Administrator Michael Regan and thank him for his hard work in creating the new Office of Environmental Justice. As the Cleveland Director of um, OEC, I serve on the steering committee for the Greater Cleveland ARPA, uh, for the Greater Cleveland Ar ARPA Steering Committee, which is a group that's dedicated to research. Uh, we're on the committee for the uh, NOAC for NOAC and their action plan, uh, their climate action plan development. And I've also facilitated panels with the Cleveland Heights Green Team to develop that shows how to develop a Cleveland, excuse me, a climate action plan uh, effectively. We're proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish this year, and we're looking forward to continue to advocate, bring conversations of environmental justice to the forefront of political discourse in the city of Cleveland. And with that being said, I will pass it back to you, Anna. Awesome. You're doing so much great work up in uh, Cleveland, Brian. That's really amazing. So I heard ordinances, commissions, um, policy platforms, uh, you know, plans going forward. Sounds like a few mechanisms local uh, governments can use to advance uh, climate action. Kylie Johnson, uh, who is our uh, Southwest Ohio Regional Director, I'd like to, I know things have, in Cincinnati um, have been, Cincinnati has been doing things a little differently. Um, through the Green Cincinnati Plan, um, which you've been actively working on this year. Can you tell me what makes this plan so interesting and what, what work you've been doing? Sure. Thanks, Anna. Uh, first, I'd like to note that 2022 has really been a fantastic year for uh, environmental progress in Southwest Ohio and specifically Cincinnati. Uh, starting back in January, Cincinnati City Council uh, held the first meeting of the new Climate, Environment, and Infrastructure Committee, which is the first committee focused on climate in Cincinnati. Uh, I was honored to represent OEC at, as the committee's first speaker and have continued to support their work uh, throughout this year. Also, another exciting regional win in 2022 is Hamilton County, uh, the county where I live, passing a resolution to join PCFO to ensure a healthier environment for all of our residents. That's really exciting. Uh, now regarding the Green Cincinnati Plan, uh, it's an effort that has been conducted uh, every five years since 2008 to set carbon emissions reduction goals to help make Cincinnati a more equitable, sustainable, and resilient city. Uh, the plan has helped establish city as Cincinnati as a national leader in sustainability, and uh, currently the 2023 plan update is in process. So earlier this year, I was appointed by Mayor Pirival to represent OEC on the Green Cincinnati Plan Steering Committee, uh, working alongside the Office of Environment and Sustainability, or OES, the Steering Committee Chair, Council Member Mika Owens, and key stakeholders from across the city. Now, while the Steering Committee is overseeing the plan update, the effort really is largely a community engagement process that started with a kickoff event at the Cincinnati Zoo back in March with nearly 300 people in attendance, which shows you how much excitement there is around this plan. Uh, and, and in addition to serving on the steering committee, I was also appointed to chair the Advocacy, Education, and Outreach Subcommittee, uh, which is one of eight subcommittees focused on different aspects of uh, sustainability and resilience uh, that's going to help our city reach its carbon uh, reduction goals. So this fall, the public was invited to attend subcommittee meetings across the city to help refine the goals, strategies, and actions for each section of the plan. So I'll, I'll end with saying that the 2023 plan update is really unique uh, and that it's going to establish aggressive carbon neutrality goals by 2050. And this is the first year that advocacy has been included as a section of the plan. Uh, what also set, sets it apart is that the intentional focus to center equity and environmental justice priorities.
priorities in every aspect of the plan. So it's really been an honor to represent OEC throughout this process and work alongside amazing partners like OES, Green Umbrella, Groundwork, Ohio River Valley, and of course the community. So uh, for anyone, if you're interested in uh, updates on the plan's progress before its anticipated passage this spring, you can visit the OES Citizen Lab page, uh, which we will drop in the chat for you. Awesome. Thank you, Kylie. Um, I I always find the stuff going on in Cincinnati um, so impressive, and I'm always impressed with your work. Um, and I love how involved, like you were saying, that first meeting, 300 people, like this, that plan has been really about involving people and um, with putting a, a justice lens on everything, like getting the input of the most impacted people is, I think, just amazing and makes every plan better. And um, I wanted to move on to uh, Molly Joe, who is our Southeast uh, Regional Director, uh, Southeast Ohio Regional Director. Um, the You've been doing great work in Southeast Ohio for the backcountry campaign. And um, I know that you've been very intentional about involving people and um, organizations in that work. Can you share a little bit about the vision for this project and the process? Thank you, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. I am so deeply honored to serve alongside more than 130 local businesses, governments, and organizations who are really the heart of the backcountry campaign in Ohio's only national forest. And for generations, the land and communities of southeastern Ohio have fueled the growth of this nation. But all too often, decisions about how to manage this place and its resources are made by agencies and industries without the real input of the people most affected by those decisions. So the Backcountry Campaign comes out of this, and it's a shared vision for the future of 30,000 acres, for reference, that's roughly the size of Cuyahoga National Park, of the Athens unit of the Wayne National Forest, which is our National Scenic Trail Corridor. The Backcountry Campaign aims to ensure the transition to an outdoor recreation economy will support the continued healing of these resilient communities, improve the quality of life for local people on the land, and protect them for generations to come. This is a campaign that not only seeks to position the region as a nexus for carbon sequestration, to center stewardship of recovering old growth forests and our precious white oak ecosystems, and to build a thriving regenerative outdoor recreation economy, but to also put the decision-making power back into the hands of the people who love and live in these little cities of the forest. And this is a multi-year campaign. Connecting with the right stakeholders and fostering community support takes time, but we believe it's critically important that we do this work intentionally and build it alongside and for the people who have been negatively impacted by the harmful effects of extractive industries who have been largely left out of the decision-making process. Awesome. Thank you, Molly Joe. I can't think of a better representative for OEC to have down there um, working with uh, local partners and getting that backcountry campaign moving. So um, next up, I'd like to go to Chris Cologne, who is our Northeast Ohio Regional Director. Um, and you've been doing uh, a lot of cool work with partners um, to bring people into the fold um, in Youngstown area. And you've also been getting some great wins in the Youngstown and Warren. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just share about those wins and some of that uh, work you've been doing with people around town. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anna. Uh, as Anna said, I'm Chris Cologne. I'm the Northeast Ohio Regional Director uh, here at OEC. And a lot of my work has been focused in the Mahoning Valley. Uh, in my time here, I have found that people uh, and working with people is where my impact can be felt the most in collaboration with several local partners, including including uh, League of Women Voters, Healthy Community Partnership, YWCA Action and United Returning Citizens. We're in the midst of a new activist leadership training program called Building a Better Table. Our first session was led by our own Spencer Dierick, uh, and our second session is happening December 14th. Prior to the midterms, we partnered with sub on several Get Out the Vote events, including Earth Day Election Edition, in which our own Chris Tavener came to speak uh, and, and shared with the, the, the group the importance of getting out and, and voting 
uh, when it comes to climate change. We're also advancing our environmental justice work by partnering with uh, the National Association of Social Workers and Ohio chapter to create a curriculum uh, around environmental justice. And we're also speaking to first year students at several uh, regional universities, including one today, uh, right after this annual meeting uh, with students at OU Zanesville. We've helped local partners with their Listen, Lead, Share events all over the Valley. Additionally, I joined the board of Friends of the Mahoning River, advocating for dam removals all along the lifeblood of our Valley, that Mahoning River. I further assisted in planning and implementing the organization's River Fest event this year. I served on the Citizens Action Board of the Eastgate Regional Council of Governments, where I advocated for green infrastructure to be included in several major construction projects. With all of that, several wins here have been had. My work alongside climate champion Lauren McNally got to see Youngstown join Warren as a PCFO community. Just a month later, Youngstown City Council, Council committed to a greenhouse gas reduction goal as they passed legislation to re-implement the Shade Tree and Beautification Commission. And Trumbull County has secured a significant amount of money to help clean up brownfields all throughout the community. So many great things happening, and we're looking forward to so many more wins in 2023. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the regional directors uh, for all your hard work at the local level. Um, we're gonna zoom back out here, uh, back up to uh, the federal level. Um, so we were talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which will have a huge impact um, in the regions, uh, being able to hit some of the goals mentioned and more. But it wasn't the only historic investment for the environment that we've been excited for. This year, uh, Ohio saw millions of federal dollars coming into the state to put toward lead line replacement, which is a great start considering Ohio is astoundingly second in the nation for the number of lead service lines. The OEC was out in Washington, D.C., spreading the word that lead water lines are a huge issue in Ohio. So when the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed with millions of dollars coming to Ohio over the next five years, we were happy to see the problem being addressed in a significant way. Pete, what else could that money be used for from the Infrastructure and Investments and Jobs Act? And what projects are you most excited to see unfolding from it? Yeah, and much like uh, our managing director of democracy policy, our managing director of water policy, Melanie Houston, is in another critical venue continuing this work. So I wanted to give her a nod for, for much of the successes we've seen this year in our water program. So in total, Ohio will receive $1.6 billion for Ohio's water infrastructure. This is going to pave the way for major investments in our water infrastructure from replacing lead service water lines to upgrading water treatment systems to addressing emerging contaminants in our water like PFAS pollution or chemical pollution. We also saw an additional $1 billion for Great Lakes cleanup restoration efforts in the past year. Starting back in February, President Biden visited Ohio to announce how this critical funding uh, from the Infrastructure Investment Act would be used to clean up Ohio's Black, Cuyahoga, and Mahoning River, or Maumee River rather, uh, which are some of our few remaining areas of concern by the year 2030. Uh, these funds will help the entire Great Lakes region make progress in conservation, water quality restoration, and habitat pr protection. The OEC and our partners held nearly two dozen meetings with Ohio's member of, members of Congress to make sure we made the case for why Ohio needed this, these type of funds. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, climate resiliency, and lead service line replacements needed increased investments, and we're hoping to build off the momentum and keep it going forward. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we also have state funds uh, that have been allocated through H2 Ohio, um, and we've been advocating for those funds um, to continue currently and, and then to continue. Um, so H2 Ohio is a water quality initiative, and a lot of money is coming from that to address water issues throughout the state, including major changes to farmland practices that have resulted in 1.2 million acres of farmland using uh, best management practices. Holy cow. Pete, uh, do you, what do you think made H2 Ohio so successful? I think really the program has been successful because it's, it's had a well-rounded focus uh, where it's broad science-based to tackle some of Ohio's most critical water quality challenges like harmful algal blooms, aging infrastructure, uh, as well as lead service line 
contamination through lead service lines specifically. And then to push the program forward, I think it's been a success because there's a really broad coalition of groups like the OEC supporting the leadership of Governor DeWine to secure over $342 million in the last few years of state funding to be supplemental to what we're seeing coming out of the federal government and really maximize those investments. In addition to the acres enrolled, just a quick look at the numbers, over 14,000 people in Ohio are now being served by 12 new drinking water projects through H2 Ohio and nearly 12,000 acres of wetland ecosystem restoration have been put in place for habitat protection, but primarily to slow water, filter things out like excess nutrients like phosphorus to get at our harmful algal bloom uh, problems. Going into next year's state budget process, we hope to again continue this momentum to ensure these results are not one-off success stories that we can keep building on this uh, water quality improvement progress that we've seen in recent years. We're also looking to keep working alongside the state's H2 Ohio program with our partners at the Ohio Agricultural Conservation Initiative to directly engage farmers to assess what conservation practices they are doing or could be doing on their land to be a better steward of water quality. And we look to keep that partnership with H2 Ohio going forward so folks can not only have the educational resources but the financial resources uh, to enable more landowners to step up uh, and do more for the water quality of Ohio. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, land management is so critical to our ability to impact climate change um, and to make our environment healthier and more beautiful. So uh, our public lands director, Nathan Johnson, has successfully protected thousands of acres of critical forest land throughout Ohio and now is in the midst of a groundbreaking case uh, against the U.S. Forest Service that really gets to the heart of how our public lands are managed and how they not only serve as critical habitat, but as our best natural weapon against climate change, if managed as such. I know it's been like a whole saga, but can you share with us kind of the really meaty parts of the Sunny Oaks legal case and its implications for how we think about land management, Nathan? Sure, happy to, you know, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So the, the Sunny Oaks case, this is a major federal lawsuit that we filed last year. Uh, it's the OEC versus U.S. Forest Service. And we're challenging the largest timbering project proposed in the Wayne National Forest in memory, uh, maybe ever since it's become a national forest. Um, and, you know, that's that's a big deal in and of itself. But there are some some big takeaways here. You know, one, we're, we're working to stop a lot of clear cuts, large clear cuts in Ohio's only national forest. Uh, but we're also working to set some really important, excuse me, important legal precedent. Uh, and this is the first case in the country, to our knowledge, that seeks to protect white oak trees. And, you know, those trees, white oaks, are probably the most important tree species in Ohio and the country even. Um, in addition to, to looking amazing and, and living forever, at least in human terms, um, every tree is, in, is different, every individual, but some of them can live 600 or more years. Uh, really incredible. Um, they're also the source of bourbon, uh, which I know a lot of folks appreciate. But um, ecologically speaking, they provide more habitat, more food, uh, more nutrition to more animals than probably any other tree in North America, uh, maybe the planet. So really an incredibly important tree. Um, a historical note, they were dominant in Ohio. I mean, you know, something like 40% of the trees in Southeast Ohio prior to European settlement were supposedly white oaks. So really incredible tree. The sad thing is though, that they've been hammered, um, especially in recent years, but historically after settlement, they just do not respond well to heavy timbering. Uh, we're losing them currently. Um, there are a lot on the landscape, but we are really, really losing them. They're being over harvested and it's a big problem. Um, and so part of what we're doing with this lawsuit is advocating, fighting, litigating uh, to save white oaks on the Wayne National Forest. And a win here could set some really important precedent for that tree, that species, not just in this forest, but um, in many other national forests across the country. So something we're really uh, excited about working on. And it's not just that, there's something connected to those trees as well. Uh, and that's the fact that all of these trees are connected by fungal networks, also known as the wood wide web. And um, these fungal networks are what make forests interconnected, interacting communities more than just mere collections of 
of trees. Um, and that's something that science has been realizing more and more that's becoming more and more part of the public consciousness as well. Uh, and it's something that um, is really exciting here for us too in this legal context. Again, it looks like this case um, in federal court is going to be probably the first major case to really bring up these fungal networks front and center um, in legal arguments and bring it before a judge uh, and, and seek a good ruling to protect these networks, to get agencies to acknowledge that they're important parts of the ecosystem and, and win protections for them. Uh, so really excited to be pursuing this case. And uh, it, it could be, like Anna said, a, ground, a groundbreaking case. Uh, pun, pun half intended there, Anna, but thank you. You can take it away. Thank you, Nathan. All right, so we have a little over 10 minutes left, um, but before, so if you have not already popped some um, questions into the Q&A, which the button should be at the center of your screen, um, please do so, ask your questions. We'd love to, to address those at the end. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to pitch it over to Dina Seco, our Vice President of Advancement. Thank you, Anna. I'd like to begin by just extending gratitude to each of you for joining us and for your support of the important work that we do every day. This annual event is such a great opportunity to demonstrate what it takes to secure a strong democracy and a healthy environment for all Ohioans. As you've heard from our program leaders today, we have a lot of work ahead to combat the ongoing assaults on our democratic systems, to secure access to safe and affordable drinking water for all, to ensure Ohio transitions to a clean energy economy in which we don't leave anyone behind, to protect the vast public lands that our ecosystem depends on to thrive, and to uplift the voices of communities across our state who have the solutions to the problems that they face every day. As we head into 2023, we will be focused on the development of a new strategic plan. This is our opportunity to build on our past progress, define the biggest challenges faced by communities across the state, and focus on the most strategic and timely solutions for those most impacted by those issues. It's our guiding light, our North Star, that provides us a clear vision to move Ohio forward. We will be inviting lots of opportunities for input from each of you to engage with us as we defined the next generation of our priorities, the first opportunity to set us up on a strong path ahead is to make a donation and invest in not only the future of OEC, but the future of our collective movement. Our opponents to progress are some of the wealthiest adversaries out there, like corrupt utility companies and fossil fuel interests, just to name a few. But there are a whole lot more of us than there are of them, and it will take all of us to accomplish our big goals together. Big gifts, small gifts, all in the middle, it will take us all. For those of you who haven't yet, this is a great time to renew your annual membership, or you can make a special gift if you've already renewed your membership this year. Your support is going to help us keep up the fight of the ongoing campaigns that you've heard about today, and it's also going to help us kickstart our collective vision ahead. Thank you again so much for your time and for your investment. I'm going to pass it back over to Anna um, for a Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Dina. Uh, I've been astounded by the generosity leading into this meeting already, and I really hope that we've shown the impact that your dollars have made and have the possibility to continue to make in Ohio. So uh, please give using that link in the chat. And if you can't give, please make sure to sign up for our newsletters using the link in the chat to um, stay in the know on our latest work as we embrace a new year. Also, if you are a member and have not already voted on our slate of directors of the board, please do so as well. We want to give a special shout out and thank you to Jade Davis, uh, who's coming off our board uh, for serving on our board for six years, and Bruce Underwood as well uh, for serving on our board for three years. Your contributions of time, talents, and more, so much more, mean the world to us. So I am Loving the questions we're getting from the audience, but we have, you know, about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to select a few of those uh, to address. And if we need to go over by just a few minutes, we can do so. But feel free to get on with your day if you need. And um, if you have to hop early, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope it's been informative and engaging and um, that you will uh, continue to, to stay up to date with us. So let me get into the questions here. So first I have a question for Nolan. 
Um, so Nolan, has OEC considered the creation of a resource that can assist local green advocates when they are often outnumbered at hearings? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Anna. And that's a that's a great question. Um, this question is referring to hearing, in particular, I think is is referring to hearings at the Ohio Power Siting Board, where we're seeing a lot of opposition to projects. Uh, large scale wind or solar projects. Um, sometimes there's a lot of disinformation or misinformation being cited. We're absolutely considering all of our options and in, in how to support those local advocates. I will say this, um, the best, the, be the most effective way that we see moving forward as we continue to be strong advocates at the Power Siting Board is to empower local advocates. Uh, statewide organizations, we do have resources and, and we can support and we do plan in the next year to continue to be active and advocate at the power siting board for these renewable projects. But the, the most effective way to advocate is for folks who live in those communities to talk to their friends, their families and their neighbors. And absolutely, we, we're already active at the power siting board and um, we'll continue to share resources and and try to identify opportunities to support folks on the ground. Well, thank you, Nolan. And uh, I will highlight that we had so many um, members and supporters um, submit comments to the Ohio Power Siting Board, just generally asking that climate change be um, included in their rulemaking when they're considering um, power plant applications, but there is a lot of um, stuff going on there. So we appreciate our local advocates uh, so much and, um, you know, contact us, you know, anytime. I, I, I guess I'll just speak for everyone, say contact us anytime if you have questions and you want to, um, you know, support renewables in your area um, and you're you're kind of running up against it. So uh, we can help out with with thinking through that. Um, this question is also for you, Nolan. So if you could come back on, that'd be great. Um, so this is uh, from Jim and Bowling Green. I am part of the committee writing a climate action plan for Bowling Green. Thanks, Jim. So far, the emphasis has been on carbon reductions, but I am concerned about the lack of focus on climate vulnerabilities, floods, tornadoes, drought, heat waves, et cetera. It seems to me these are critical to overall climate mitigation. Do you have any suggestions or advice? Yeah, love that question. And Jim, we're gonna post some resources in the chat here, um, but I'll just say first, it's great that you're involved in your local Climate Action Committee. I think that's one of the most effective ways to take action on climate change. So all attendees, that's a, that's a great way to make, make change happen. Um, we actually released a report this summer focused on exactly what you're referring to. Um, it's called the, the Bill is Come and Due, and it's focused on the cost of climate change to local municipalities. So beyond um, kind of, you know, oftentimes on, in climate action and, and in the climate conversation, we talk about the human impacts of climate change, and, and that's obviously crucial and important, but this report is entirely focused on how local governments will be impacted by uh, the resiliency type uh, measures Jim mentioned. So we dropped the link to that in the chat. I think that's a great resource. Of course, you can always reach out to our team for more details. I uh, also wanted to uh, refer to the, the Cincinnati, uh, Green Cincinnati plan from 2018. There's a resiliency section in there um, that might be helpful for reference as well. And um, as always, feel free to use our team as a as a source and as a, um, a way to help. All right, and I'm just gonna note real quick for the team, I think there's two links to the Cincinnati plan in um, the chat, but uh, the cost of climate change um, report, we'll throw that link in there soon. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll talk to Nathan next. We have a question um, that is, what is the status of the Wayne lawsuit? Yeah, um, no, thanks for the question. It's a good one. So right now we're mostly through the bulk of briefing, uh, most likely. We filed our, our merits brief and the, uh, the, the federal government Department of Justice has filed their merits briefs as well. 
so at this stage, most likely the next major uh, event is going to be oral argument before the court. Uh, that's not yet been scheduled, though, but uh, we will certainly let our members know and the public know when that um, opportunity to, to tune in or, or uh, take a look at the proceedings uh, comes up and gets scheduled. So thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, cool. I think so. We are just about out of time. I think we'll go um, with one more uh, question and we'll do this one with Chris Tavener since uh, he's back. So, Chris, yeah, uh, thank you. So, um, I was wondering if you could just go over again. Um, sort of what's at stake with the with the ballot initiative just since you're back here i want to would like to to hear from you about um why the ballot in, ballot is initiative is important and what's going on with the the referendum or the yeah, so, uh first off uh thanks to the team for answering whatever democracy questions were asked earlier uh i'm not sure if they told everyone but uh, lame duck session of the General Assembly doesn't follow the rules of when we have our annual meeting. And so I was down at the General Assembly for a committee hearing on some potentially really bad democracy bills. And one of the bills that uh, is being considered by the General Assembly right now is House Joint Resolution 6, which is proposing to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot in May next year uh, during one of the lowest voter turnout elections in Ohio. Uh, that would make it harder for Ohioans to pass constitutional amendments. They would raise the threshold for citizen initiated constitutional amendments up from 50% to 60%. And make no mistake, this is in very, very clearly a direct attack on Ohio's um, right to direct democ democracy. Ohioans have had the right to direct democracy since 1912 when they themselves put it in our constitution to say that we can create constitutional amendments through the citizen initiated process. Uh, and uh, the General Assembly, um, the supermajority that is in there because of unconstitutionally gerrymandered districts, is trying to shore up that power to ensure that we can't, for instance, create a new constitutional amendment to stop the unconstitutional gerrymandering that has occurred over the past few years. So uh, that's what's happening right now. It is not currently passed through the General Assembly, but uh, we will, it, it's very likely that this will be moving very quickly. And that's why I was down there, but I'm uh, uh, glad that I was able to make it back for the last few minutes. Awesome, thank you so much. And I see um, hopefully people's uh, questions, additional questions have been answered um, directly in the chat, um, but feel free to reach out to us anytime at OEC at the OEC.org. And you know that'll get routed to the best person to um, chat with you. I'll also note in terms of um, the community organizing and advocacy, um, someone, you know, plus one that I will uh, just remind everyone that on our uh, website, the OEC.org, you can find our advocacy toolkit up in the top right corner. There's a direct link to it. And so there's a lot of, um, if you haven't checked it out already, um, great places to start um, with your local and state advocacy. Um, and so we love seeing you all get involved. We appreciate um, all of your actions that you take year round, um, including, you know, supporting us financially, but then also um, just, you know, every time you use your voice, every action that you take in your home, it all adds up and it all matters. And it re really does take all of us to um, have progress in Ohio. So with that, we are going to wrap and we will, uh, we have recorded this session. Um, so we will send that out. And I, I noted that someone um, wanted uh, the links that we've shared in the chat. So uh, we'll try to gather those together and, and share those as well. So with that, thank you all. Thank you to uh, the team for, for talking to me today. And thank you all for uh, watching. Have a great day.